How's it going everybody? Welcome to another uh, video on critical failures. This one is a little bit different than our weekly campaigns or accessory recaps. We're going to be going into some of the lore of different parts of D&D, different encounters, modules, etc. So super excited about this first series. This is one of my favorite one shots there is and that is Death House. Death House is a standalone or a part of Curse of Strahd one shot that puts a party through absolute craziness inside a haunted mansion-esque style house. Now, going over this, uh, there is a mix of what everybody wants in D&D. There's exploration, RP, combat, uh, a huge risk of death, especially early on. Um, it is, you know, not a campaign or a module to take lightly. There's a lot that goes into it, a lot of prep, but it is one that I guarantee your group, your party members, will not forget. Um, but first, before we get started, I'm going to go over a few things as a DM I recommend before you actually run Death House. First thing first, you do need to know the lore of Death House. All the rooms are connected in different ways. Um, there is lore with the family, there's lore with the cults, there's lore with Strahd if you're playing Curse of Strahd. There's tons of things that you want to connect to this house to make sure that you know, you know how to adjust to go on the fly to make things connect even more for the party. Now when it comes to a group size, I recommend level 3 to start, and I recommend about 3 to 5 players max when it comes to the house. Now, I don't want people less than three just because, you know, you can die very easily in the house with one to two people. But anything over five, um, that's when the party separates a lot and kind of ruins and speed runs through this house when it should be kind of this creepy Scooby-Doo-esque crawl throughout the entire estate. Um, I recommend level three to give your party a chance to survive. But if you are one of those DMs who wants to play more of a rigid survival or if it is a one-shot, feel free to make it a level two. I just think level one, they die pretty easily. Um, another thing before you get started I would recommend is creating a small table of minor encounters. Five to ten that you can use on the fly, and they don't have to be combative. I do not recommend them to be combative. There's enough combat inside this house that you'll be here for several hours. Um, I would recommend things like doors opening, music heard, a faint smell of perfume. Small things that can let the party um, question their surroundings, but not give anything away. Uh, without further ado, we're going to be going over some of the lore of the house, very briefly, some of the rooms of level 1, 2, and 3, and then kind of a quick recap. This series is going to be probably about uh, two to three episodes, so we're not going to go into the attic or go into the catacombs today or even the lower chambers. We're just going to be going through the base of the house. Um, now, if you're watching this, you should already be you know, assuming that there's going to be tons of spoilers. This is a complete overview, very, you know, sharply over the entire uh, building and house so if you are planning on going in this blind or you are a player who wants to play it i would recommend not watching this video and coming back at a different time i'll give you a second to leave all right you decide to stay so story of death house is one of dread jealousy and evil this house was constructed by the rich family the durst family who was led by gustav durst the father he had a wife named elizabeth two younger kids named Rose and Thorn, and then a new baby boy named Walter. All of them, as well as the servants and nursemaid, moved into this new fine establishment. Uh, but over time, the Durst family, specifically Gustav, began to get trapped with this desire for power and greed as he joined a cult to summon different creatures and deities uh, with his cultist uh, followers. Elizabeth tried to stay out of it as much as she could, but she leaned in as well several times. Uh, to the point where she got her hands into some of these rituals and assisted as well. Now, a lot of this is kind of a mixture of homebrew uh, that kind of helps flavor the story a little bit more. Uh, so feel free to change things as you would like. Uh, that's the fun of Death House as well. Now, the group, they wanted to appease Strahd. So for Curse of Strahd, that's kind of the big overseer vampire of the land. And they wanted to get his blessing and his respect. Um, but all of their different rituals never worked. Um, until adventurers started to come through the road and into the house for refuge, in which the cultists would snap them up, heal them for sacrifices, and use their spirits to try to summon more of these creatures. Now, Strahd got very annoyed with this because he looks at, at adventurers as his playthings that he can put in these horrible encounters to make them suffer, and that this, these cultists are taking them from his world. Uh, he showed up to the Durst house, slaughtered Gustav, uh, Elizabeth, and all the cultists, uh, leaving them to haunt the realm forever inside this house. Um, when it comes to Rose and Thorn, we'll talk about what happened to them. Uh, they perished in a very somber way as they starved to death in the attic. 
Uh, we'll be going over all that once we arrive to the attic next episode, though. But let's get started. As we said, there were some cultists that lived inside the lower basements. These individuals would sacrifice different animals or people to try to summon these beasts and creatures and abominations, but to no avail. There are some characters that I really do want us to know about. We have Thorn and Rose, who are the two siblings inside the house besides Walter, the newborn baby. Uh, Gustav, which is the owner, the father of these two. Elizabeth, which is the wife. And the nursemaid, I call her Tess in my campaigns. She was the nursemaid who plays a huge role in the story of this family. Now, how I would play Thorn is he's a seven-year-old boy uh, who's very skittish and shy. I would have him typically hiding behind Rose all the time, peeking his head out, hiding with his stuffed animal. Uh, maybe encounters throughout the house is him like peeking behind doorways and running away. Um, he's a very big baby, is how I play him. Uh, but if there is a party member who is funny or caring or kind to him, he'll make a connection with them and try to stick around them, maybe giving gifts, etc. For Rose, it's a little bit different. She is 10 years old. She's very protective over her brother, but she's also stubborn with leadership. She wants to be in charge and have her hand in everything. So if the party wants to do something and she does not want to, she will throw a fit, she'll yell, she'll scream, just like your, you know, your average teenage uh, individual. Um, but she's a good character to play as well. And if there's a leader in the party, maybe a connection could be made with them. Um, Gustav, however, is a bold, greedy man who fell into the powers of greed. He found the dark arts, he found the cultist, and he would perform all these different rituals at the time that um, were as one of the downfalls of the family. I would play him, for the sporadic times you'll see him, as snobby, arrogant, if it's illusions, maybe show how he was kind with his family before he fell into the cult, uh, before he, uh, he lost his mind. Elizabeth, which is the mom at this time, uh, I would play her relatively normal um, and for like the beginning illusions, but as time progresses until you actually see her, she is jealous, full of rage and anger, um, as she believes that Gustav cheated on her with the nursemaid Tess. As Tess had a baby, they took care of the baby inside the house, and Gustav spent a lot of time with it, making Elizabeth jealous, and being one of the reasons why Elizabeth decided to kill the nursemaid later on in the story. For a test, the nursemaid, you can play this however you'd like. You can make her innocent, so maybe she had a child with another servant or somebody else and was just assumed by the Gajeshers and Gustav to be cheating. Or she could be a person who's madly in love with Gustav and did have an affair. You can play that both ways. Uh, for Walter, you rarely see him, so if you want to play him just as a generic baby, maybe more creepy aspects, that is up to you. But now what we're going to do is we're going to be heading into the actual house. We're going to be going very sporadically room by room, not too far, um, as we kind of look at the different rooms, some different encounters I would recommend adding. So first things first, outside of the house is where the party is going to meet um, the two siblings, Rose and Thorn. The house is old, battered, beaten up. Uh, the shingles fall off every sporadic moment. Uh, the front gate is rusty and loud as you open it. Um, for the two kids, Rose and Thorne, they will describe to you that there's a monster inside the house, their family's in there trying to get rid of it, and they have a newborn baby boy, a brother upstairs, uh, that's part of the family who's in danger. They would plead and beg the party to help. Uh, they can't offer much, but they promise that their family is rich and could probably give them something in return. Going inside into that first section, however, this is when we move into the foyer. The foyer is relatively basic, but it's pristine. When you describe the first couple layers of the house, I want you to describe it as a clean, pristine house, almost as if it's well-kept and uh, untouched by the age. Don't make it look like a cobweb-filled house or creepy. Make it almost seem like it's well lived in. Uh, but in this foyer, uh, there is a large shield that has the family insignia on it. You can make this a regular shield or like a uh, decorative shield that has no purpose, such as, you know, in combat it will break relatively easily. And there's tons of portraits. You can have it as maybe the first image of the house being built or the family when they were younger, uh, like small family collages at this time. When you move into the main hall, however, this is one where I would put a little bit extra work in. There is a sword above the fireplace and there is a large staircase that spirals up and many doors. I would add a little bit more, maybe like a very nice rug, chandeliers from the ceiling, marble statues, something to really give this place some life. 
We'll move on here to the next one. This one doesn't have a lot to it. It's the storage closet. You can find nurse outfits, maid outfits, brooms, some small things like that. Um, but the dining room is one you can really have some fun with. So uh, inside there's tapestry and there's some wooden carvings of mysterious things that the party can investigate. But what I would do is have the party here laughing, clinking of plates from the outside, and maybe peering through the keyhole they can see shadows moving on inside the area. But when the door opens, the place is completely vacated. Um, it is you know, well furnished with crystal silverware that's very expensive, but everything is perfectly needed and there's nobody inside. I would recommend all the fireplaces in the house, whether you want to have them sporadically pop up with flames to show illusions, or if the party does something specific such as lighting their own fire, I would show snippets or side moments of this area of the house. Maybe the fireplace turns on and they see the family celebrating a holiday dinner at the table, and then the fire fades away. That could be something you can always add. Then moving on down here to the hunter's den, this area has taxidermied wolves, a large stag head above the fireplace, big fluffy um, chairs. There are some cabinets that you can find some wine and some crossbows in as well. I would have the wolf's eyes like watching everywhere where the party goes to bring that suspense. But if they destroy the wolves, these are just taxidermied wolves. Um, there's some other cool items in there that you can find, crossbows, bolts, uh, decks of cards, stuff like that. Now where the creepy factor should begin now is inside the kitchen. There is a pantry back there that has food. Uh, it's bland, no nutritional value. It looks good, uh, but if you take it away from the house, it turns into dust. Um, inside here, there's a dumbwaiter, which is used to transport food throughout the entire house. This is a huge focal point that I really recommend you using throughout the entire module. Um, with a dumbwaiter, I would put a bell on each level, so wherever the actual elevator of the dumbwaiter goes, a bell would ding, knowing what floor it just hit. What I would do is when they're inside here or oh, leaving that room, they would hear that ting, that quiet uh, bell that goes off, and inside maybe the dumbwaiter has a note, maybe it has old food, maybe it has uh, a creepy toy or doll. Um, a lot of things you can do with this dumbwaiter. Now I would recommend using this a few different ways. You can build up suspense through small items or you can have your first death scare. I would recommend doing it on the second floor, but if you want to just start off showing this place can kill you, I would do this on the first floor. It is when the individual, the adventurer, puts their body in to look around, the dumbwaiter snaps and the entire thing falls with full speed and with a deck save they have to pull their head away or they get decapitated. End of story. They're dead. I would make the, D, uh, the DC extremely low, like an 8 or 9, because they have time to see it coming down, um, and it gives them a chance to not die in the first 7 minutes of the campaign. Now, I would recommend the second floor, but if you want to use it here, you're more than welcome to. Alright, that is the first floor of the area. Uh, so it's a lot of suspense building at this part. Um, another thing with the dumbwaiter is if it's a small creature, they can transport themselves up and down, which is pretty cool, so it's also a means of transportation. Um, don't be afraid to have illusions or specters visible for a moment. Maybe it's Gustav walking up and down the stairs with confidence before fading away. Um, but if you want to hold off on this, um, the supernatural as long as you want, feel free to hold on for the second and third level before we really get into the hauntings. All right, as we continue on to the second section up here, um, we have that main kind of hallway over here. What I would recommend is the portrait above the fireplace, which is a family portrait of Gustav, Elizabeth, Thorne, Rose, Walter, and the nursemaid. Um, I want you to definitely detail some of the facial expressions to the group. Uh, seeing the scowl on Elizabeth as um, Gustav holds Walter, the new baby, and that jealousy grow. And that's something that can grow the story. In the lower room over here with the piano and the harp, what I would say is leave some mundane small encounters, things like hearing some keys going off or a harp string pull. And inside what I would recommend is either having it being completely vacant or having a raven sitting at one of the instruments. Um, whether they shoot at the raven, whether they attack it or watch it fly, it will dart towards the fireplace igniting the flames. Um, if you would like to go that fireplace route of the illusions. If not, have it fly right up the fireplace and just disappear from sight. In the upper section here, which is the study, tons of items inside the desk, tons of items inside the fire, uh, not the fireplace, uh, the bookshelf. Uh, one way to open up this secret room back here is have a book where if they pull on it, it will open up into that section. In there is tons of old pieces of scrap paper, and there is a chest at the end with a skeleton hanging out of it. 
The skeleton was killed by a dart trap that killed the skeleton while they were trying to break in. An old adventure. Inside there is the will, the deed to the house, the deed to the uh, windmill, tons of different things. So I would add a couple more things too for flavor. In the servant center over here, we can still use that dumb waiter for some things such as maybe like a head popping out, a hand, or that guillotine-like trap that we talked about. But besides that, really nothing much else. There's some old servant clothing, there are some empty foot lockers, just some stuff for them to explore casually. This kind of some imagery of what that raven would look like, like standing on top of that piano before it <laughs> flying off into the uh, into the fireplace. Now going up to the third floor, this is where it's going to get a lot more chaotic, a lot more combative. So going up here, there is a suit of armor up here that walking by it, it will attack you. So this animated armor will swing its blades or its axe um, and will try to kill the party. Now this combat could be as long as you want it to be, if you want to follow the stat block. One thing I always recommend is uh, if they're able to push the armor down the stairs, maybe that stunts the armor and stops it, or it kills the armor straight upright. Something like that, a big kind of grand attack, throwing it across the staircase would be pretty cool. Moving up to this upper section, this main bedroom, this master bedroom, tons of good relics in there, some treasures, some other things that could be collected. Um, what I would do here as well is maybe hide some more like antique relics or things that will be costly, uh, a little bit more gold to have. In the bathroom down here though, I would have this as another trap. What I usually do with this is I have the group come in and they see a diamond ring or some type of object inside the bathtub. Touching it will pull on a thin string that closes the door and acid begins to fill the bathtub. Now they have about two turns until the entire floor is covered in a layer of acid, emitting 2d6 acid damage each turn. No dex aid. Um, the only way for them to break out is with either a combined strength score or an individual strength score to try to break the door open. Once the door is open, the acid disappears, but the damage would remain. Below it is a storage closet. In there, there's soap, there's brooms, there's all the things that you need to kind of have a tidy house. Um, but in there, one of the brooms is animated, so it will try to attack some of the uh, party members if they linger too long. The lower section here is the nursemaid, uh, the nursemaid's room. Now, this is where the nursemaid's specter is supposed to be for that combat, but I have a couple other recommendations for it as well. Now, in this room, what I would recommend is the mirror in there to show the nursemaid on the bed or standing behind the party. Um, you can either have it where they turn around and they fight the nursemaid, or you can have it where they turn around and they see nothing there. Both are really good options. What I would recommend personally is for them to see it, the nursemaid to disappear, and then the nursemaid to reappear in a different area of the house. What I would recommend is the dumbwaiter up in that uh, master bedroom. That is where it's going to crawl out, kind of almost like a ghoul or gas-like humanoid form out. I think that would be a really cool option. In addition to that, there is a crib off here to the left inside the nursery. What I would recommend is hearing the crying of the baby or the squealing of the child and investigating the room. They could either find the skeletal remains inside the crib or nothing. I think both are really good options. So these are all really good ways to kind of explore this upper section. There is some combat with the armor, with the specter kind of floating around, and these traps that can kill people pretty easily. So um, what I would also recommend is anytime they leave for the balconies, what I would say is they just see an endless mist below, almost as if it falls forever. If they try to drop anything off of the balcony, it just looks like it goes for eternity. If they jump off of the balcony, uh, I would say that's kind of up to you. If you want them to reappear somewhere else in the house in one of the storage closets, maybe it all goes white and then fades to black. Or if you want them to just plummet to their death, that is up to you as well. I think those are both really good opportunities and choices to really show that being in this house is you know a true nightmare another thing that i think would be a good realization is if they are planning on going to leave the house to check in with the kids or come back down have that door lock that front door and opening it would reveal a brick wall that would be extremely useful uh, because you don't want them going in and out of the house having that sense of freedom but having them panic and realize they are trapped is a really important feeling so you really focus on that bath scene, really focus on some of those other areas because this really gives the house light and now the paranormal activity is starting to pick up more and more. So, quick, quick, 
episode talking about Death House. We didn't go into all of the under depths, the attic and the catacombs and all that yet. We'll have that for next episode. But today we kind of went over a little bit of the main story, a little bit of it being uh, a little bit homebrewed as well to kind of flavor it, and a little bit of my recommendations for running this. This is a fantastic one shot for the holidays, especially during Halloween. October is a great time to run it. But even if you want something like a you know, a Christmassy nightmare kind of esque version. You can always tweak it like that as well. This is one of my favorite one shots. It was great to run. Uh, group size, as I recommended, about three to five. You don't want to go under three because people can die pretty easy, and you don't want to go over five because people will split up and it'll mess up some of the encounters. I would recommend a level three. If you want to go a higher level party, uh, obviously make the group size smaller. Maybe if you want to go below three. Um, but if the party is large, maybe that's when you want to keep a level one, level two, if the party's okay with that. Now focus on things like sensations, the smells, the tastes, the sounds that you hear. All of these things are important to build up that anxiety, that uh, paranoia. Have some false scares, some things that sound like they're supernatural. When you turn, it's a rat by the pots or something like that. And for clue style, just you know, follow the story. There's a lot of kind of mysteries and don't be afraid to lean on them or kind of nudge the party in different directions if they need help. All those are extremely important. Some encounters that we talked about was the dumb waiter crawler, which is having that nursemaid crawl out instead of being in the nursemaid's room, being by the dumb waiter. The dumb waiter guillotine trap is always a good death trap. It's extremely scary. The bathroom trap shows that isolation and panic. And the fireplace images would be good to tell the story because if they miss a bunch of core or specific rooms or pieces, they're going to be missing the chunks of the story that you want them to know. So I think that is another way to definitely kind of give them that information in a way that's palatable, but also makes sense. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you watching our first episode of How To Death House One Shot, kind of describing the lore, how to run it through my perspective. I ran it about 10 times, so it's one of my favorite ones to run. Please feel free to follow us on YouTube at Critical Underscore Failures or on Twitch at Critical Failures D&D. Um, all of these are great ways to watch our videos. Our weekly schedule for this week is Baldur's Gate Gameplay. So uh, myself, a few people from the Wednesday campaign and some others are going to be live streaming our gameplays on Baldur's Gate. Great game. It's been a blast. We just are about a few hours in, so we're still relatively new to the story. Uh, we will always have our Icewind Dale campaigns Wednesdays at 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, um, give or take 10 minutes or so for setting up. Great group, great stories. You get to see Scully. You get to see everybody across the board there. Now, we will have our Part 2 of Death House Thursday at 8 p.m., so that will be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, Baldur's Gate gameplay and the Icewind Dale campaigns, those will both be on Twitch and YouTube. Death House, like this, will be a YouTube exclusive. Session recaps will be a YouTube exclusive. And then at the end of the month, uh, those critical recaps are going to be Twitch and YouTube. So lots of stuff packed, lots of stuff going on. I appreciate you so much for watching. Um, and hope to see you for Wednesday for our campaign and all the videos along the way. Have a good one.